You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and this is my conversation with a fella from the US of A called Philip Pendergast. He's in an outstanding outfit called Chemis. And Philip, I know you're listening, so I hope I pronounced the name of the band correctly there. What I will also say is that this is one of those conversations that makes me really grateful for what it is that I'm able to do. So here he is, Mr. Philip Pendergast from the band Chemis. Going. Good, how are you doing? Good, good, good. Yeah, I was just um, finishing up finalising an interview with, um, I know you're from the US, but um, what's the lad's name? He's from Canada. Uh, Theory of a Dead Man bass player, Dean Back. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so no, having a good morning actually so far. What, what time is it over there in your part of the world? It's 8pm. 8 8pm. 8 well, hopefully it's beer o'clock for you, mate, as we say <laughs> here. <laughs> it, I think it's going to be after this. I've been working all day, so... Oh, shit, um, yeah. That's the problem with rock and roll, mate. It doesn't pay the bloody bills, does it, even in a yeah. great band like yourself? What What do you do for a crust outside of playing in Chemis? Um, I, so I just started working a new job. I'm basically a, like a statistician uh, for the U.S. Census Bureau. Sounds complicated. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, another smart guy playing rock and roll, mate. Yeah, so what drew you to play rock and roll if you've got a a career in something as specific and as dedicated as, as being a statistician with, with the U S government. Um, I just, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know that that was going to be what I was doing, you know, um, six years ago, or I guess it was six years ago when we started the band. Um, you know, I was just a grad student like, uh, Ben and, um, I don't know. We both just needed kind of an escape from that life, and uh, we both just needed to be in a new band again. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. Like historically, at least since I was in high school, I've just played in bands uh, that never went anywhere or did anything really. But you know, it's always just been a necessary part of uh, who I am. And yeah, I get that. Yeah, uh, I feel the same so, way. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I see your picture. You got a guitar right here. Or it looks like a bass, probably. Bass, huh? yeah, bass player, yeah. That's yeah, it. but, um, so, you know, you're probably a little disappointed then that you're not talking to Dan, but... Uh... Oh, not at all. <laughs> no, it's all good. Okay. I've, I've really been enjoying your album, I've got to say. I mean, look, I get a shitload of demos and official releases through Nuclear Blast and Arise and all, all the other labels out there, indie la not indie labels, but, you know, labels who are releasing top quality heavy metal product as i like to call it but yours has really been impressive i was on saturday i've got two young daughters so i'm out the back with my putting green mm. and my artificial grass and i'm got the cat and the dog out there as well and we're listening to your album mate and it was great entertainment i've got to hand it to you and i'm 40 years of age so for me that's really important that i can put on rock and metal around my kids and you know they don't care about the swear words because they don't understand what's going on or what have you but yours yeah aim what i call amiable entertainment that can be used in a variety <laughs> of settings so well done hey thank you um and you're safe too because there's no swear words on the album <laughs> oh <laughs> all, all good either way but I, look i've been really getting into it as i say look i get i'm a bit over some of the black metal and all the rest of it you know i, I like to listen to things with a bit of melody but also retain yeah. a sense of grit and that real mm -hmm. he, true heavy metal spirit which i think you guys have got you know so Tell us, tell us about the album then, because I was trying to trying to draw some comparisons, and what I came up with, and I might be completely off the mark here, and it's probably showing my vintage again, but Fu Manchu. Get me with it, so Fu Manchu. Okay. Paradise Lost. Uh huh. Melvins, and I definitely heard Neurosis. Okay, that's interesting. I feel like um, like we we've gotten some of those comparisons in the past, and um, with this new album, I think that what we were kind of shooting for musically was um, to celebrate more of the influences that we have from um, more like classic metal, like uh, ah. uh, Merciful Fate, um, uh, Judas Priest. Uh, and then in terms of, um, you know, like heavier, more extreme metal, um, like Celtic Frost. Nice. Um, Brilliant. But uh, – Definitely also Paradise Lost would probably be like the prime like the primary kind of doom influence for this album, I think. I definitely heard that. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, um, yeah so I think you na you nailed it on the head with that. And then there's I can definitely see how you would get some Fu Manchu vibes from like maybe the third track, uh, Flush to Nothing and um 
maybe like a little bit from kind of the vocals and stuff sometimes. Um, yeah, that might have yeah. been true. Yeah, yeah. I think it was also the way you craft a song because there's a lot of melody yeah, there yeah. too. And when you mentioned Priest or Merciful Fate and probably even Maiden as well, if we're talking about those two bands, yeah, I can definitely hear that now that you mention it. I guess my head, yeah. my head was just in that, I don't know, you know, that, that fuzz fuzz rock and fuzz metal yeah. space when I was listening to you guys. For sure. I think it's probably a more um, dramatic distinction for us because we really started off as like this very fuzzy band on our first record um, mm. and like much more of kind of like a, you know, sleep and uh, neurosis kind of influence. And then uh, we've kind of gradually played with cleaner guitar tones. I know that sounds probably ridiculous from uh, listening to the record like you've been doing, but, um, you know, we're just using amp gain basically on this record and, um, and including a lot more of the dual guitar stuff and um, the kind of classic uh, melodies and faster tempos. And so to us, that that was kind of a, a way of expressing sort of a inspiration by those bands that I already mentioned, like Merciful Fate and uh, hmm. Judas Priest. In terms of the melodic structure of the guitar playing, kind of more Merciful Fate, whereas in the past we've been influenced by Iron Maiden, I think, a little bit more. And, uh, then for the vocals, I think I, I probably listened to more Judas Priest than, uh, anything else, uh, while we were writing the album. So yeah. I, um, kind of drew some inspiration from that, even though, you know, obviously I don't sound like Rob Halford, but just, uh, in terms of the approach to songwriting, trying to craft memorable songs, uh, with a lot of melody and a lot of vocal parts that try and jump out and grab your attention. That was kind of the blueprint that I was trying to follow. It's interesting you mentioned that about the vocals because one of the things that I did read online prior to our, our interview in preparation for it was that um, it wasn't yourself, it was um, the other gent I was going to talk to was mentioned that the lyrical themes, he was kind of speaking on your behalf but without talking for you, talking yeah. about themes of depression, anxiety and the like, and they're themes that I like to explore through my own writing as well. So it, yeah. did, did any of those themes, along with the Judas Priest influence, the Rob Halford thing, did any of those themes... In, come on to the new record here well i think i so i only really know how to write like personal songs that are uh for better or for worse kind of like a reflection of whatever i'm struggling with at the time or mm. i think on this record i also tried to sort of like capture the way that other people in the band uh the kind of experiences that they were having and basically um it had been a really hard year for a few of us and um there was I don't want to get into any details because sure. yep. you know they're not speaking for themselves, but um, there was definitely a lot of mourning and um, kind of like, uh, for lack of a better word, like just complete like aimlessness and loss, um, not just in terms of grieving or anything, but in terms of like your own personal understanding of mm. uh, yourself and um watching yourself be drawn back into like patterns of thought that are unhealthy and, um, uh, you know, struggling to kind of, uh, find the light in, um, in your day to day life and, uh, those kind of things. So there was definitely like an influence on both kind of, you know, more melancholy delivery and melodies, but also, yep. uh, on the lyrics, you know, especially and pretty literally. So, you know, I think unfortunately they don't send out uh, lyrics with promo copies of albums, as far as I know. No, um, they don't. Yo, and... I wish they did, actually. It would help a lot if they did, were able to do that at Nuclear Blast, to be honest, yeah. I do, too, because, um, you know, one thing that I really have kind of prided myself with about this band since the beginning is that I think um, I've always, like, doubted myself really heavily as a songwriter, but then... Uh, what I end up with on the record, um, I think I end up doubting myself because it's too like honest and it's kind of painful uh -huh. to like really, you know, commit those words to tape to something that everyone's going to listen to. Yep. But at the same time, I think that's probably one of the more powerful aspects of music. And um, I, I always end up being like more satisfied with the lyrics than a lot of other things and finding that. I wish more people paid attention to them because usually in metal, it's kind of a throwaway. People are singing about fantasy maybe, or, yeah. 
um, kind of a lot of like tropes that are very familiar um, because that's the style. But, um, you know, I really try to avoid that um, completely. And, uh, you know, it's something that I wish more people could pick up on. Uh, so, you know, if you were interested or something, you certainly could, uh, I don't know, I could send you the lyrics or something like that. Yeah, I but... wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, but yeah, cause I, I did, I, I don't know. It's, I didn't, I didn't, I was listening to the album and I was drawn to it. Now I'm very like, like it, it sounds like you are mate. I'm very intuitive with these sort of things. So we tend to get yep. drawn to things that we should be drawn to in, in, from an artistic perspective I'm talking about. So it doesn't surprise me that you're talking about, your lyrics having very meaningful themes and not just waffle and with all due respect to the great man Ronnie James Dio style lyrics which I could never get into love the band's music but the lyrics have never done anything for me to be honest and neither have even yeah. a lot of Iron Maiden's lyrics to be quite frank with you I was always that was my issue with metal a lot you know the Man of War style lyrics and stuff I appreciate that there's an element of living in a fantasy and escapism and all the rest of it but I've always been grounded as it sounds like you have been too you're living day to day in the real world and real issues affect you so of course they're going to come through mm -hmm. in your your lyrical themes so yeah I, I i think it's i think it's great that you're playing the type of metal that you're playing but you're talking about real things that affect people yeah absolutely i mean i think that like that's what touches me more if i'm listening to a songwriter you know like i'm a, I'm a really big fan of um of people like uh I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, who's a good example. Um, well, I mean, some really obvious ones would be like Neil Young and sure, yeah, Tom Waits. Sure. Yeah, no, and, definitely. Yeah, um, you know, people like that that are, I think, write and like even like Bonnie Raitt, um, John Prine, um, people that write like really personal uh, but poetic lyrics. And um, I tell you, just um, somebody who I was lyrics I was reading the other day who astounded me was Dolly Parton's lyrics. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, I love Dolly Parton. Yeah, incredible, incredible insight. Mm -hmm. Just a wonderful human being sharing a story, you know. And of course, yeah. you, you know, she's known for a few other things. Let's face it, but her lyrics are profound. Oh, absolutely, and she was a great singer too. I mean, like that. Uh, one of the songs in particular that really sticks out with me uh, with her is that uh, Coat of Many Colors song. Okay. Uh, where she's talking about her upbringing and her mom um, patching together this quilt um, so that she would have something to wear because they were so poor mm. and her going to school and being ridiculed for it and told that she was trailer trash and uh, you know that she was worthless because she was so poor and had this ragged coat but that she always saw it as being beautiful because she recognized the work that went into her. And it's, it's just like a really, um, for being like a two minute long song, it tells like a very detailed story. Uh, I don't know there, you know, there's tons of examples like this, but, um, yeah, I'll get what yeah, you're saying. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And your lyrics are in that vein though. That's, but you're playing in a metal band, but your lyrics are in that vein. And what I think you're giving yourself an opportunity there is longevity, which is key in this business. You know, yeah, I mean, I hope so. And I also, honestly, like, I'm really, um, I really hope that through kind of our own, like, pain and suffering in life that we can somehow bring some good out of it hmm. and that it can positively influence people somehow. Otherwise, what's the point of, you know, enduring all this shit? And um, <laughs> that I, I would yes. hope that, that, you know, maybe, and this has happened before on like past albums that we've had fans come up to us and say like, oh, you know, like that song, I could relate to it so strongly, like it helped me sleep finally, or, you know, um, that like this, uh, this expressed something inside myself that I've dreamed about and that I've been horrified of since I was a child and I didn't know how to express it. Mm. You know, things like that really mean a lot to me because it means that we're having a positive influence on people. And I would just hope that by kind of bearing your soul and being so emotionally honest that, yeah. um, you know, other people can also feel the same emotions in themselves if they're there and relate to it and maybe experience some healing as well. So, you know, really explicitly, I think that that's something that I would, I would hope, um, music is capable of, and that I would hope that we're capable of, even though I know that that's pretty grand and, a little like foo foo, but um, 
No, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me at least anyway. And I'm sure, um, you know, it's – I actually – because I have a host a radio show, if it's cool, mate, I'm going to release this as a part of my podcast series and radio show because I think it's really important that people get that third dimension. Apart from just listening to music, they hear the thoughts and feelings and the aspirations of the person who's written the actual bloody songs. It's crucial to me. Um, I'll just go off on a tangent quickly. I remember years ago, 1995 or whatever it was, I remember listening to a band called King's X, who you've probably heard of, um, their yeah. album, mm-hmm. Dog Man. It, yeah. And, of course, back in those days, CDs came with lyric booklets, exactly like we're talking about, you know. Right. And I, I remember I was in a uni course that I hated, you know, I left school and I was um, I was going to a uni, I was doing science at uni, which I'm totally not equipped for, I'm more of a human, my strengths are in the humanities, and I was feeling a bit, bit alone, very isolated, and I was reading these lyrics that this fellow from the US of African descent had written, mm-hmm. and it was like as if he was speaking directly to my soul, as if this is what my soul couldn't articulate at the time, but it's what yeah. I was feeling, you know, the yeah. language of emotions, you know. So, And I think your your music is going to do the same thing for a young fellow or a young lady out there who's going through some deep shit and needs some help and probably don't have the skills or probably might not even be in a social situation where they can reach for that grasp mm-hmm. onto it in a physical sense or in, a, in an emotional sense and so they're going to have to reach for it in any way that they can and your music's going to be like a light in the dark for them yeah i mean that's 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 really well articulated that's like exactly what i would hope for because i've had that same experience before um you know that you're talking about and yeah. not necessarily with king's x but um you know i've definitely had that that same feeling um and you know it, it's kind of um it's selfish to want to feel that way uh, or to try and want to make other people feel that way. There's something that feels kind of like egotistical about that to me. But um, a lot of it is really just because it's something that I need to express uh, and be honest about for myself. And then through that, my intention would be that I hope that it can also be the same thing for other people. So um, I don't know. That's kind of an important distinction that I wanted to make, I guess, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's cool that you're recording this for a radio show because, yeah, I, I, I think that that would be um, interesting for people to hear. Maybe I, I don't know if anybody cares, but yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel the same way. Like I've, I've done heat of like hundreds of interviews at this point, and I get so little feedback on them. To be frank with you, but I do yeah. know from the few random people that I bump into who I don't know that give me feedback. People listen and look. It's and and the thing about these things too is that I just look at them as signposts for. A conversation and a, they're a conversation at a moment in time. That's what they mm-hmm. are. So today's date for me, at least, is the twenty second of May. I know it's the twenty twenty first for you because it's the night before our day after, right. so to speak. Right. But, but it's a conversation that acts as a signpost for a narrative or a thread, conversational thread that you had today. And people are going to pick up on this. And the way the internet works these days, I've found my podcast episodes in in not translated into Russian, but they're in Russian websites and. God knows wherever else they end up. So I simply don't know who's going to listen to this and what they're going to take out of it. But what yeah. you're saying, mate, is 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 very important. For it's a very important conversation for people to listen to. Should they be able to get into your music? That's the yeah. that's the grander point. Yeah, I really appreciate the platform to try and do that. Wonderful, mate. Let's talk about how you actually get together and write the songs then. So is, sure. it one of, is it one of those things where you was the, the, the lyricist and, and the front man, so to speak? Do you bring an acoustic guitar into a rehearsal room, into a lounge room somewhere, and you show the lads some, some riffs and whatever you've got, or talk us through actual, the actual songwriting process? No, definitely not. So um, let me preface this by saying that I also had our other guitar player who does the heavy vocals for this band. He um, also collaborated with me on some of the lyrics on this album and really helped me kind of flesh out some ideas. We hadn't really done that quite so thoroughly before. So, um, I wanted to kind of say that. And then also, um, we, I mean, for us, the vocals always come last. Um, and we, it's either me or Ben, uh, we bring in guitar riffs. Um, sometimes we'll have like a basic structure for an entire song, but usually what happens is that we all have such like different influences that we bring to the table that, uh, by the time it makes it into our rehearsal room and we're working on an idea, uh, it ends up almost always being pretty fundamentally uh, rearranged in some way. So maybe uh, Zach, our drum play, our drummer, will play a very different beat than what I 
you know, imagine in my head was sort of the rhythm for a part and it'll take on a totally different life. And then that'll demand that the next part maybe has to be this way. Maybe it has to go into a fast guitar melody or maybe it has to slow down and turn into like a sludgy, uh, slow part. And then a lot of that and the direction that songs go that we write is determined by sort of how the rhythm and the melody of the previous part that we're working on sort of resolves itself. So I think we often try and think in terms of like, what's the best place for the song to go next rather Mm -hmm. than like this riff would be cool with this riff, which is kind of how me and Ben approach the ideas that we bring in, but that it ends up changing a lot uh, when we play it as a band because we're all actively arranging what we think will produce the best song yeah, it's a collaborative effort. Ideas. Yeah, 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 exactly. Definitely. Okay. It doesn't work that way for most bands, you know, that I talk to. It's more like there's a, you know, there. What, what do I call it? Um, benevolent dictatorships. Somebody brings in a sure. song. This is exactly how it's going to go. And look, having been in bands myself, a lot of bloody bands, I'm still in bands, it typically yeah. works that way as well because otherwise you'd sort of get too many cooks in the kitchen. But you're, able, yeah. you're obviously finding that you're all on the same wavelength and you can collaborate very easily. Well, I think what the interesting thing is that we're all not necessarily on the same wavelength and that we can think of ways to I, kind of turn ideas on their heads, you know, mm. uh, in, in ways that are more interesting than the parts maybe initially were. And so, um, you know, so like maybe an example of this is like for the last song on the album from Ruin, there's this guitar part that starts off the song that's very like kind of methodical and uh, melancholy, this little guitar, single note guitar line. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, eventually at the end of the song, it comes back in over a completely different riff um, that's established in the middle of the song uh, with vocal parts. And the way that that all came together was very organic because none of us expected that that guitar part would work over this other riff. Uh, We had this other riff already because it was part of the song. And then we just kind of realized that, that, um, you know, all of a sudden, like epiphany, oh, that will actually work over this. And I think it creates like a really distinctive ending to that song. And so um, I don't think that's something that any of us could have thought of in isolation of each Mm -hmm. other. Um, And that's something that's pretty common, I would say, in uh, our songwriting is that something kind of emerges and we're like, oh shit, that is how it goes. Um, And the reason that I think that it's not necessarily super different from other bands is that I think that that kind of thing happens to some degree with a lot of bands. But um, we, and we originally started off, me and Ben sort of bringing in like full songs and basically they didn't change that much Mm -hmm. when we were playing them together as a band. Um, But that over time, I think we've just learned to trust each other's abilities more and, uh, that that's made us naturally more collaborative and that I think that overall it's also improved the songwriting because we're more confident in being like, okay, that part only has to happen one time or, you know, okay, we can repeat that twice uh, as long as it comes back later in the song or um, some kind of songwriting trick where an idea can stick, but it can also get out of the way really quickly. Uh, And, that's something that I think comes from that collaborative process. Otherwise Mm -hmm. you get so married to your own ideas that you want to, you know, your part doesn't get established unless you hear it four times. Um, and that, that kind of songwriting is something that we are trying to, um, do less and less of in favor of kind of this more, um, like I was talking about, like song oriented, uh, songwriting. Mm -hmm. Feel free not to answer this question if it's going to be incriminating, but do psychedelics sure. or things of that nature, do they play a role in songwriting for you? Well, um, so I'll say that I haven't I haven't used any psychedelics in really actually since we started the band, um, but I, I, I've definitely had a lot of uh, good and bad experiences with them before. And, um, that one of our early songs was actually like directly, um, something that I wrote, uh, about, uh, uh, like a, a really harrowing experience that I had where I broke my jaw and almost bit my tongue off Jesus, and man. was convinced that I was dead because I was bleeding all over the place and I didn't have anyone to help me. And, um, so, and that was related to, uh, 
extremely high uh, uh, psychedelic usage. And um, so actually it was that experience that kind of made me become more invested myself in wanting to play heavier music. Yep. Um, and that was kind of like the like rock bottom that my life reached at that point in time. And that, um, so that first song, um, that I wrote that, uh, about that experience with, uh, the bereaved is what the song is called from our first I album. Could, Absolution. Could yep. Um, it was a, it was kind of the catalyst for everything else that happened with the band after, because I think, I think it's the best song on that first album. Um, it was also on our EP that we released before that, which was just like some demos. Um, and it was the song that got our producer, Dave Otero interested in working with us. And, um, otherwise we would have never worked with him. And I doubt that we would be, uh, making the same records that we're making these days. So I think really that was kind of the most formative experience in my life that led to the band being successful. Um, so while those experiences haven't influenced my songwriting directly per se, Mm -hmm. uh, indirectly through the consequences of a really negative experience, it sort of gave life to this band. Um, at least my involvement in it and my, uh, interest in, uh, really taking it seriously. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty long qu- answer to your question, I guess, but it's a wonderful yeah. answer to the question actually, cause I, I, I do believe in the very positive role, even inadvertently as it has been in your, in your specific case here, but the very positive role that psychedelics can offer the songwriter. I mean, from, from the Beatles through to Pink Floyd, through to Yes, through to all of the most you know, timeless music, the music that's going to survive well beyond our generation of the next, it's all been influenced in some way, shape or form by the use of psychedelics. And I know that a lot of the prudish out there will want to deny that, but it's certainly, you can't deny the facts. Mm-hmm. There's an enormously beneficial experience. It's an enormously beneficial thing to be able to go through the experience of psychedelics and come out of the other side and, like in your case, have this wonderful story to tell. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think the most important thing was, um, that I definitely have achieved like complete ego destruction from those experiences and, um, that you really just start to learn to think about yourself and your place in the world in a different way. And, um, that I think what I was going for when this really, uh, horrible thing happened was that I, uh, was going to, I was trying to push much further past that. And, uh, I basically learned that, (laughs) If maybe it's not a good idea. So I, I almost like hope to see uh, that song as like a cautionary tale uh, against mm. uh, psychedelics being like a an overtly and completely positive experience, um, because I think that there's also some danger there for yeah. sure. You're playing uh, with fire, as but... we've seen with Sid Barrett, you know, and yeah. <laughs> uh, and others, yeah. but. Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's that's interesting, but um, it looks like I might actually have another interview coming through here. No worries, mate. All uh, right, well, look at a second. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, sorry. I, I wish I didn't have to cut you off from having a really good time. But uh, no, that's yeah, all good, I, mate. I'll, I'll hit you up. My name's Andrew Mackay Smith, and I do host the Scars and Guitars podcast. That was my conversation with Philip Pendergast. He's a singer in a band from the USA called Chemists. Thank you so much for listening.